So if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get to it. Now, if you'll remember, one of the most significant means by which land-based empires grew in Afro-Eurasia was through the means of gunpowder. But in maritime empires, they... Wait, hard, stop. Maritime. What does that word mean? You'll see it all over the curriculum. If you don't know what it means, it will cause you endless trouble. But don't worry, I'm going to explain it up real nice for you. Maritime just means related to the sea. Because, you know, if you're on a ship, you're generally having a merry time. <laughs> Just me? Okay. Whatever you do, just don't miss that meaning. So as I was saying, during this period, maritime empires didn't primarily grow because of gunpowder like the land-based empires did, but they grew because of other factors. And we'll discuss all those factors in other videos, but in this video, I just want to talk about the technology that allowed that growth to happen. Now, as you know, Europeans had long benefited from trade on the Silk Road and the Indian Ocean, but because Muslims controlled much of the land and many of the ports that those trade routes passed through, Europeans had a very difficult time establishing trade on their own terms. And it was at that point that a significant question began to press itself upon the European imagination, namely, is there another way to Asia? And in order to answer that question, they started looking westward across the Atlantic Ocean. But before they could go traipsing off into the sunset, they needed new technology for their ships. Now, they had learned plenty about sailing from the Greeks and the Asians and the Muslims, who at this point were advanced far beyond the Europeans. And one thing the Europeans inherited was increasingly accurate records of wind patterns. Also, they inherited increasingly detailed astronomical charts. Now, Maps of the stars have been around for a long time. The Mesopotamians produced them. The ancient Chinese did as well. But over the centuries, the maps have become far more complex and detailed. Also, the Europeans inherited technologies like the astrolabe and the magnetic compass and the latine sail. The astrolabe told sailors how far north or south they were from the equator. The magnetic compass gave sailors the ability to know exactly which direction they were headed thanks to the north-south magnetic field that runs across the Earth. And the Latin sail was a triangular sail that could catch wind on both sides of the ship, as opposed to the old square sails that could only catch wind from one direction. And for those ships that successfully combined square sails and Latin sails, that meant they could travel further into the ocean and therefore expand trade routes. Now let's talk about new maritime technology from two countries in particular, the Portuguese and the Dutch. The Portuguese created a new ship called a caravel. And some of the chief advantages of the caravel compared to the older technology of ships are as follows. The caravel was much smaller and therefore was highly navigable along coastlines and rivers. Not only were they small though, they were also fast. And that was because their combination of square sails and latin sails. But despite their diminutive size, these caravels could carry metric buttloads of cargo for trade. Now let's visit our Dutch friends and see what they're up to. The Dutch invented a new ship as well, and they called theirs the Vloot. And this ship was truly a game changer, and here's why. You see, most merchant ships before this time were built in such a way that if they were needed for battle in a navy, they could easily be converted into a warship. And for all sorts of reasons that aren't important here, that meant that these ships were very expensive to build and required giant crews to sail them. But when the Dutch built their fleet of flutes, they built them exclusively for trade. And that meant that they were built with much larger cargo bays and could carry much more tradable goods than before. And that also meant that they could sail these ships with much smaller crews. And that also meant that they could build these ships for about half the cost of the older kind of ships. And the result of this is that the Dutch had a growing competitive advantage in maritime trade. Now, you take all this, you throw it in a pot, Baby, you got a stew going. When you pull the ladle out and taste some of that stew, what's it taste like? It tastes like the rapid expansion of European trade from 1450 to 1750. Now, I said earlier that gunpowder wasn't the primary way that these maritime empires grew, and that's true, but that doesn't mean that the Europeans did not use gunpowder. Oh, they used it. Add a little gunpowder to our stew, and the Europeans have all they need to sail fast, dominate maritime trade, and blow up copious amounts of their fellow human beings. All right, that's what you need to know for Unit 4, Topic 1 of AP World History. I'm here to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam. So if that's something you're into, then click the subscribe button. If you click right here, you can support me on Patreon, and YouTube thinks you're going to like this video right here. All right, Heimler out. Hi, and welcome back to Heimler's History. We're in Unit 4 of AP World History, and in the last video we talked about how the new maritime technologies allowed sea-based empires to grow. And in this video, we're going to talk about who shelled out all the Skrilla to pay for all that exploration. And the answer is states. So why did states sponsor maritime exploration from 1450 to 1750? Well, let's get to it and find out. So let me start by telling you in general why these states sponsored this exploration, and then we're going to look at several European states in particular that did so. In general, we can say that states sponsored exploration for three reasons. Gold, 
God and glory. First, gold. Now, in order to talk about this, I need to introduce you to the economic system that dominated Europe during this time, namely mercantilism. Without getting into the finer details of this particular economic system, all you really need to know is that a mercantilist saw the world's wealth like a giant pot, which is to say there is only a fixed amount of wealth to be had because they measured wealth in terms of gold. And the thing about pie is, if I'm going to get a bigger piece of the pie, that means that somebody has to get a smaller piece of the pie. And so one of the main reasons these rulers were motivated to expand their empires across the sea is because as they established these trading posts, that meant more gold for their coffers. New trading posts means new wealth. The second reason they expanded is because of God. Europeans were, by and large, Christians, and since Christianity is a missionary religion, they felt it their duty to convert people from distant lands. And so there was a religious impulse in this expansion as well. And the third reason for expansion is glory. At the end of the day, nothing puts an empire's glory on display more than controlling a large empire. And as many states began to claim territory over the sea, a fierce competition grew up between all these different states to claim certain lands before the others did. And to me, this sounds like a couple of three-year-olds sitting on the floor playing with toys. Three-year-old A picks up one of three-year-old B's toys, and then three-year-old B pitches a fit because he wants that toy. And when his mom bends down to three-year-old B and says, but you haven't played with that toy in a year. You don't even like that toy. To which the three-year-old responds, no, that's my favorite toy. We all know that the kid doesn't want the toy. He just doesn't want the other kid to have the toy. Anyway, those are three of the major reasons that states began to sponsor sea-based exploration. Now, let me pause for a second and emphasize some change and some continuity. People from all over the world had always explored the seas. What's new here is the large-scale state sponsorship of such exploration. Okay, now let's turn our attention to some specific examples of the state-sponsored exploration. And I reckon we should begin with Portugal. It's hard to think of another nation whose state exploration knot was tied tighter than the Portuguese. And why is that? Well geography for starters. As you can see here, Portugal juts right into Spain's backside, and that means they only have one way to expand, namely into the sea. And there are a couple of Portuguese explorers worth noting. First is Bartholomew Diaz. In 1488, Diaz sailed all the way around the southern tip of Africa and then returned home. The second is Vasco da Gama. Ten years later, he sailed around the southern tip of Africa and continued all the way to India. And when he landed in India, he claimed that territory as part of Portugal's empire, as one does. Now that was just the beginning. In 1514, Portuguese traders arrived in China, and initially they had very little effect on the Chinese, but after the merchants came the missionaries. There were two sects of Catholic missionaries that made it their aim to convert the Chinese people. The Franciscans worked to convert the mass of Chinese people. The Jesuits worked to convert the elite. Now they did have some success, but mainly the Christians were rejected as barbarians, and therefore their impact was pretty minor overall. But with all these accomplishments under their belts, the Portuguese then turned their attention to empire building. And for them, it wasn't the traditional means of empire building, which is to say, get as much land as possible under your command. Rather, the Portuguese established what's known as the Trading Post Empire. This means that they claimed small amounts of land at strategic locations around the African coast and throughout the Indian Ocean. And their goal was to possess a complete monopoly over the spice trade and to charge all other ships passing through the ports that they control. And now let's turn our attention to the backside into which Portugal is so unceremoniously jutted, which is to say... Spain. The Spanish state also sponsored lots of sea-based exploration, and two names you should know here are Ferdinand Magellan and Christopher Columbus. Magellan was the first to circumnavigate the globe by going west and then south around the tip of South America. And when he landed in the Philippines, it wasn't long before Spain annexed the network of islands and set up a significant trading post that attracted many Asian merchants. Then there's our friend Christopher Columbus. The Spanish state sponsored this guy to seek a new westward route to Asia and to look for some gold and silver to boot. Eventually, that journey across the sea led Columbus into contact with the Aztec and Inca empires, where he found metric buttloads of gold and silver sought by the Spanish. And that discovery made it worth the expense to keep traveling there. Now, eventually, the Spanish discovered that if they enslaved the native peoples and later Africans and forced them into agriculture, that they could become wealthy beyond their wildest imagination. Now, of course, Columbus's contact with these peoples led to some massive changes in the world, and that's known as the Columbian Exchange, but we're going to save that for the next video. Okay, I reckon we need to talk about the English. In 1497, the English state sponsored an explorer named John Cabot. His aim was to find a northwest passage to Asia so that they didn't have to sail all the way around South America. It turns out he didn't find such a passage, but he went ahead and claimed all the land from Newfoundland down to Chesapeake Bay for the English. 
1607, the English established their first colony called Jamestown in the Chesapeake Bay. And needless to say, that action had some consequences, but we'll have to save those for another video too. All right, let's talk about the French. The French also wanted to find a Northwest Passage through the Americas all the way over to Asia. And when they couldn't, they went ahead and claimed part of the land, which is now Canada. And when they found out that this was a land that was rich in natural resources, they gave up on trying to find Asia. Canada would do just fine. And just one year after the establishment of Jamestown, the French established Quebec. But in general, the French did not establish permanent settlements like the English did. Instead, they became more interested in using these new territories as trading posts with the natives. And, as you might imagine, that meant that the French had better relations with the Native Americans. And finally, let's talk about the Dutch. In 1609, the Dutch state sent Henry Hudson to seek a northwest passage to Asia, and he found what would later be named the Hudson River, and though it didn't lead him to Asia, he went ahead and claimed the Hudson River Valley for the Dutch and called it New Amsterdam. Okay, that's what you need to know about state-sponsored maritime exploration in Unit 4. Here you can subscribe to the channel, and I'll keep making videos for you. Here you can support this channel if you're feeling so inclined, and here's a video that the YouTube algorithm thinks you're gonna love. So get your clicky finger ready and do your worst. Heimler out. Hi, and welcome back to Heimler's History. So in Unit 4 of AP World History, we've been talking about the expansion of sea-based empires. And in this video, we're going to talk about the momentous change that occurred when the Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere came crashing together. And that change has a name. It is the Columbian Exchange. And if you're ready, I'm ready. Let's get to it. First off, if you're new here, my name is Steve Heimler. I'm here to help you get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. And if that's something you're into, then subscribe and come along with me. And I know I'm not the only one who's making AP World History videos out there, but I'm doing it the most balded, the most bearded, and the most gap-toothed. All right, enough of that. Let's talk about the Columbian Exchange. And I don't think I'm overstating it to say that the Columbian Exchange changed the world on a scale that few other events had. In the short run, the Columbian Exchange meant disaster for the natives of the Americas. But on the other hand, it meant extraordinary wealth and profitability for the Europeans. But in the long run, for all involved, the Columbian Exchange introduced new ways of life and new ways of death through the mutual sharing of the East and the West. So first of all, what is the Columbian Exchange? Well, its name comes from our good buddy Christopher Columbus, who's landing on the island of Hispaniola launched this whole exchange. But if you want a definition, it's essentially this. The Columbian Exchange is the transfer of people, animals, plants, and diseases from the east to the west and from the west to the east. So let's start with an upper. Diseases. Until Columbus arrived in the Caribbean, Afro-Eurasia and the American continents were completely isolated. And through a series of unfortunate or fortunate events, depending on how you look at it, these two worlds came crashing together. Because of this long-term separation of these two people groups, the Native Americans had no immunities to some of the more devastating European diseases. And the most devastating of the bunch was smallpox. Smallpox was an airborne disease that Europeans had been exposed to for many centuries. And even though it was still devastating, they had built up some immunity to it. But when the white people showed up in the Americas and started coughing all over the natives, the smallpox contagion was deadly to a people who had never encountered it before. It was this disease that was responsible for the large-scale death that occurred in the Americas. In general, historians estimate that it wiped out about 50% of the native population. And in some places, upwards of 80 to 90% of the native populations were destroyed. But that's not all. The more Europeans arrived in the New World, the more diseases they brought with them. They brought malaria and measles and the flu. And all of these wrought disaster on the native peoples. And in terms of its scope, you could compare it to the devastating effects of the Black Death in the former period. All right, if you're sufficiently depressed after that, let's move on to some happier matters, namely animals and food. The sharing of animals and food in the Columbian Exchange actually went both ways, from east to west and from west to east. And in many cases, these food and animals, when they were introduced into these societies, had massive effects. For example, the Europeans introduced pigs and cows and wheat and grapes into the Americas. And these food items eventually became staples of the American diet. I mean, what would we be today without beef? I mean, I know that 50% of your population is dead from smallpox, but on the upside, cheeseburgers. The Europeans also introduced horses to the Western Hemisphere. And the adoption of that animal changed the lives of the Native Americans who lived in the Plains regions. After they learned to ride horses, they were able to hunt buffalo with greater efficiency, and that meant, in many cases, excess food. Also, the horse gave tribes a competitive advantage against other tribes who did not have horses, so not only could they kill buffalo better, they could kill other human beings better, too. But there's also some food that traveled from the west to the east. The Mesoamericans introduced some very important food items to the Europeans. For example, you had cacao, also maize, which is a kind of corn, and potatoes, which is a kind of potato. And when these were introduced to Europeans, it led to an expanded diet and, more importantly, massive population growth. All right, now let's look at the Columbian Exchange in terms of agriculture and labor. Now, 
even though the first European explorers were in search of gold and silver for the most part, they found that if they devoted these colonies, these new lands that they found, to agriculture, they could get fabulously rich. But there were far too few European colonists to attempt that kind of large-scale agriculture, so what to do? First solution? Enslave the natives and make them do it. And this kind of worked, but there was a major problem. Turns out these natives knew their own land way better than the colonists did, and so they would often escape their enslaved conditions, often to the hills and to the forests where they would never be found again. For example, the Portuguese dealt with this in their Brazilian colony. They started growing sugar cane there, and it made them so wealthy that when the natives ran off, they just went and cried in a bag of money. But it wasn't long before they got tired of crying into their money bags, and they came up with a different solution. And that solution was to import enslaved labor from Africa, and in Portugal's case, especially from the Congo Kingdom. This solved the problem of the natives so rudely escaping because the Africans knew the land less than the colonists did. And as the demand for sugarcane and in other regions, tobacco spiked, so did the demand for enslaved laborers from Africa. And that meant that millions of Africans were forcibly removed from their homes and made to participate in what was called the transatlantic slave trade. But in a strange turn of events, even though the African population was being largely deprived of its menfolk, the African population in general rose significantly during this period. And the reason is, again, because of the Colombian exchange. While enslaved people were being transferred from the east to the west, foods like yams and manioc were being transferred from places like Brazil into Africa. And those new foods created a massive population spike. And finally, we need to talk about the environmental impact of the Colombian exchange. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that the natives of the American continents have been farming for many, many centuries. And they had developed ways to live with the land sustainably. But when the European colonists arrived, and grew wealthy through agriculture, they started using the land much more aggressively. And that led to large-scale deforestation and the depletion of the soil. And because the Europeans tended to live in more densely populated settlements, they put a greater strain on the water supply and introduced a lot of pollution to boot. All right, that's what you need to know about the Colombian Exchange. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. If you want me to keep making these videos, then subscribe and come along. And if you want to join the inner circle of Heimler's history enthusiasts, then you can consider supporting me on Patreon. Heimler out. Hi, and welcome back to Heimler's History. For the last few videos, we've been in Unit 4 for AP World History. Strategic locations along the...